JC Direct this week. Saab wants a lower inflation target. What does that mean? How do they get it? And uh, what are the implications? Sasol gets a secunda reprieve. That's a biggie for now. PGA miners are flying. And I mean, literally, we have takeoff. Fitch cuts China's outlook to negative. Multi-choice and Canal Plus agree to work together. And We Buy Cars listing is set for Thursday. Hello and welcome to JC Direct, episode 282 for 11 April. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. Let's kick off with some events we've got coming. We've got two of them. Uh, one is next Thursday. It is 5.30 p.m. It's a power hour with Standard Bank. It will be both webcast and live at the Standard Bank offices in Baker Street, getting started in shares. And then the following Tuesday, 11 a.m., we're going to be chatting with One Invest. We're going to be digging into their offshore ETFs, most notably their tech ETF, which is by a long way the best performing ETF on the JSC at this point. Just one lap.com slash events for booking and more information. So I suppose we start with Sasol. They really were the, the big story of the, the week. Uh, they got their reprieve. So we go back to last year where the minister basically said, uh, or some, it wasn't even a minister, rather, it was someone in the department, who basically said, yeah, the way you guys are doing your emissions at Secunda is just not cool. What, 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 what Sasol does is looks at the quantum and uh, what the department wanted to do was look at the density. Uh, we can argue the merits of it. I, you know, there's an obvious differences between quantum and density. Uh, density is really bad for Sasol. Quantum, apparently, a whole lot less bad. Sasol says, you know what? It's not so bad for the people living in the area. The department had said it is, but they appealed to the minister and the minister agreed. That is the biggie. The minister agreed. The stock has bounced, make no mistake. And there's a, a weird support line which I'd pulled into the chart at around about 140, 130, which dates all the way back to a massive gap in February of 2020, the pandemic gap, of course, which has had proved a little bit significant in the past, and certainly we saw it hold this time. Sasso, I'm, tr I'm recording this uh, pre-open on Wednesday morning, trading at about 170.96, strong bounce off the 140, 130-odd support level. Uh, stock is looking good, and this is good news for Sasso, but good news in the short term. Longer term, Sasso still has challenges. Secunda is still a hugely polluting plant, and that is just the, the stark reality. So they've got away with it for now, but they're net zero by 2030, which is what, six years away? If we look for target prices, although if my memory serves, the Standard Bank target is not here. Correct. Standard Bank has a target price on Sasso, 550 Rand. Man, that's just a crazy price. Absolutely a crazy price. Nonetheless, the current range, and this is only from eight analysts, three holds, three buys, and two strong buys. The low average is 142, the average is 215, and the high is 281. The current price, as I said, just below 171. So that is certainly saying there's probably some upside here from Sasol. And I suppose the question is, is how much higher can it go? Uh, I want to pull up a weekly chart here because weekly gives us a lot more information. Certainly, I think that 200, 220 level looks possible for now. But if you are a trader and you've held it and you got in around that 140, you've had a good bounce. You might want to be taking some profits here. At some point, we will start to see some level of pullback in the Sasol share. Make no mistake about that. But here's the really big story uh, of the week, I suspect, and that has been PGM shares. It started on Monday with a massive day for the, P for the PGM miners in South Africa. Uh, in part, it has been helped by the underlying, uh, what do we want to say, by the underlying move in the commodities. But let's go have a look at some of these performance charts. So uh, we've got huge moves, as I said. And if we just literally go back to and say, you know what, uh, let's take it from the beginning of the month. In other words, the 1st of April. In other words, we've only got a handful of trading days here. This is not the biggest that we've ever seen. 
So this is literally hardly any trading days at all. Uh, and what have we got? So the PGMs have been moving. And as I say, this is from 1st of April, um, up 8.9, platinum up 8.4%. Those are big moves in of themselves. But the stocks, Implats and Northern, both up 23%. Uh, Sabanya, I hold it, up 20%. Theresa, up 17%. Uh, and Anglo Platinum, really lagging, up 3.4%. Now, Neil Froneman, CEO of Sabanya Stillwater, essentially called this. It was what, back in February, I think, where he said, you know what, this is the bottom. So let's just do a quarter to date. Uh, if we've got the quarter to date, that's the period we're looking at. I want the, let's do year to date rather. If we do the year to date, it's looking less thrilling, although the PGMs year to date are flat. Anglo Platinum down 16, Northern is flat, Sabanya up four and a bit, Implats up five and a half, Theresa up seven, just over seven percent. So the year's not been great, but certainly this quarter, since the first of April, has been pretty spectacular. Question is, is this the start of the bull market? So there, there really are Two things that matter. Well, I suppose three. The, the, the third is the companies themselves. And what we are seeing is they trying to get their balance sheets in order. Uh, we're seeing some. Theresa do share buybacks, which at this price levels is really, really good, of course. Uh, they are cutting back on production. These are all the right things that you expect to see at this point in the cycle. The other two are supply and demand. Now, supply is going backwards, right? Because so less recycling happening because prices are low, uh, less supply coming in because we're seeing production cuts from the miners. Then we come to demand. How is demand looking? Well, the key demand is catalytic converters, new motor vehicles. Now, there's two issues here. One is what about electric vehicles? We've seen some softness in electric vehicle sales in the first quarter of this year but nothing significant really. It's more about the consumer buying cars. A consumer that is sitting in many parts of the world under pressure, the US is the exception, I appreciate that, but the rest of the world, the consumer is sitting under pressure and the world over sitting at high interest rates, which means surely demand for new vehicles is, shall we use that fancy phrase, soft? In which case, where is the price going from here? I think we've had the run. I think PGMs can maybe do a bit more, but I would be cautious about jumping onto this bandwagon. I'm already in it. I got Sabanya Stillwater, of course, they've got some gold. Gold futures trading around $2,370 an ounce. That is certainly absolutely helping them, but we need this price going. Rhodium, largely unchanged, hasn't been half as exciting as the others. Look, we'll take it. Make no mistake about it. If you're holding a PGM miner, your portfolio is looking lacquer and you are deeply happy as a result. Make no mistake about that. Uh, coming through early Wednesday morning, Fitch cut China's outlook to negative on risks from debt and weak growth. This is not a surprise. It's going to be bad for China, make no mistake about that. And we've actually been seeing some positive moves on the, the, the Chinese stock market. Let me call up the China 50. China 50 is probably the sort of more fair in terms of, of what we're really looking at in, in, in terms of, of uh, 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 what am I trying to say? more fair in terms of what we're looking at in terms of pure China. A lot of the China picks in Hong Kong and the like at the same time. We don't want a historical graph. We want to go and look at a bog standard graph. So China is, pro is looking interesting on the charts. Question is always, can it hold? And I gotta say, downgrade to negative, it's not surprising. China is struggling at this point in time. Absolutely, it is struggling. But surely we knew this. I've spoken about China before on this webcast. I've spoken about it on my Money Web Now webcast. I've spoken about it on my The Week That Was TV show. I've talked a lot around China. I think the weakness in China is not a surprise. Debt, yes, we've spoken. Evergrande and the property stocks. We know all about that. We also know about weak growth. Absolutely, we know about that as well. And if we look at the Chinese index, and it's kind of been going nowhere for the last couple of months. It popped up back in uh, last week of February, and since then, pretty much going sideways. Keep an eye on it. Let's wait for the break. We've got two local China ETFs. If you go to justonelap.com, just search China, you'll find those ETFs. They've got the details there. One is from Signia, one is from Satrix. The Satrix one is my preferred. You go read the details, you can find out the whys.
The other big news is that We Buy Cars will be listing on Thursday. We've known about this for an age. If you are if you held transaction capital at close yesterday, which was Wednesday 10, you get about 0.3 and change We Buy Cars per transaction share that you've got. By the time you listen to this, it's quite possible that uh, it's already trading, depending when you're downloading. The expectation is a share price of 18 Rand 75. That, that is math. The market will truthfully decide in a price. Gives it a market cap of about 7.8 billion. Uh, that's about 2x what the transaction uh, share uh, market cap is. Let me check on that transaction market cap. I, it, it, it is a unlock of value. I mean, of that there is absolutely no doubt. You're going to end up net net ahead. Uh, transaction is no, okay. Transaction is about seven and a half billion. This is 7.8. Basically, we're getting the we buy cars, and the rest we can say, well, hey, what's left there? Transaction did get some cash. They've been selling shares into the market uh, to, to various different folks and Coronation took a big stake. That will help pay down some debt and all. I like the We Buy Cars. I appreciate it's tough out there. But a moment ago I was saying, you know what? What we're not seeing is massive demand for new vehicles. Does that help the second-hand market perhaps? I'm not convinced necessarily by that can't afford a cough. New secondhand, I mean, I appreciate there's a difference, but I'm not sure it's going to be that telling a difference. I think the bigger issue here is that they plan to gain market share. They've got, I think it's low double digit market share, low teens. They plan to grow that into the mid 20s. And I can see how that happens. Uh, secondhand cars is not a fun experience. Dodgy places and dodgy parts of town, in many cases, and apologies to the legit lacquer secondhand car dealers. So I've only ever bought secondhand cars, uh, and I've largely managed to avoid the dodgy parts of town, and actually the dodgy dealers, which is probably just luck more than anything else. But I think it's an industry that's ripe for disruption, and that's what We Buy Cars has been doing and looks to continue doing. I've spoken before by anecdotal evidence that the prices you're getting are less attractive. They used to be premium to book value, and now anecdotally folks are saying to me they're actually at a discount to book value. So it's less attractive to sell your car to we buy cars, but that's a function of the market, right? That's just how it rolls at this particular point in time. So Governor of the Reserve Bank has made this comment a couple of times, and he's come out again more recently and saying, hey, you know what? This inflation targeting that we have of 3 to 6 percent, and you'll notice that the governor always refers to 4 and a half percent. He's not interested in that range of 3 to 6. He wants the 4.5. And he's been talking and saying we should revisit our inflation target. In short, it's too high. Let's be clear. He's not saying it should be higher. He's saying it should be lower. But let's, I mean, what is inflation targeting? So as a concept, relatively new. Uh, new Zealand were the first to bring it out. December 1989, they were the first country to have this idea around inflation targeting. And it, it makes intuitively some sense, right? Because otherwise, what's the MPC, in our case, FOMC, wherever it might be, what are they doing? They're looking at inflation, and on gut, they're saying, mm, too high, too low. But having a target, what you get is the market can say, well, you know, the U.S. above target. Between my recording and you listening to this, we will get U.S. inflation. It's out, uh, Wednesday afternoon. So it gives you a sense of where the inflation is relative to the target, and therefore, what can we expect from the monetary policy committees and central bankers around the world. That absolutely. So New Zealand in 89 were the first, Canada then came along, uh, Europe and the US and South Africa all in the early 2000s. But I went and did digging, and I did this a while ago. I chatted with Adrian Seville on my Money Web Now podcast. Okay, so what's the science behind the 2% number? There is none. There is absolutely, absolutely not. The U.S. has frankly said, you know what, we needed a target. 1% seemed too low. 3% hmm, seemed too high. I mean, who wants their money devaluing at 3% a year? That just seemed too high. Well, therefore, how about 2%? So there's no massive science in the targets. Ours was, again, about 20 years ago, early 2000s, we got inflation targeting. Tito Mbaweni was our governor at that point in time. And the idea was... Let's do a range rather than a number. And under during that period, which was, remember, Mbeki, Manuel, and Mbaweni basically running the finance cluster, well, Mbeki, the president at the time, we had a fairly, a fairly low inflation rate, and it kind of worked. What he's saying now is, hang on, 
four and a half, which is the number the governor looks at, is simply too high. Who wants their net worth, their everything devaluing, their their their, their salary, their, their 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 money, their savings devaluing at four and a half percent a year? No, man, it's a giant number. So he's saying, let's look at a new number. So what would that new number be? Three, two. Probably not two, but certainly possibly three. Here's the problem. Let's say the governor got this all approved and understand that this is a massive process and not going to happen. Notwithstanding, it's a parliamentary process as well, but it's also going to have a lot of people with a lot of opinions. And it's going to get very noisy. We're looking at having rate cuts later this year. Okay, maybe not as many as we'd hoped, maybe not uh, as fast as we'd hoped. But we're going to get rate cuts later this year. That's our four and a half percent target, which the MPC says they expect inflation to reach late next year. Now suddenly our target three percent. Well, rate cuts are off the table. Rate cuts are gone, like boom gone. Like suddenly our rate cuts are late 2025, maybe early 2026. In other words, we're in a higher interest rate environment for at least a year, maybe a year and a half or two years longer. So I don't panic. It's not happening today. But I do think, therefore, the timing is right. Let's start this conversation. Let's get this conversation going about should we, A, instead of a band, have a fixed number, and B, what should that fixed number be? And if it should be lower, we don't move it down at this point in time when our inflation is in the high fives. No, no, no. We wait until our inflation is three, three and a half, and then we quickly move that target. In other words, we probably only move the target in 2026, maybe 2027. And we can actually put a trigger in place that says when inflation hits three and a half, the new target will be three. Excellent. Nice and simple. But I think it's important. Let's start this discussion. Let's have this conversation because a four and a half percent inflation target is it's emerging market economics and we are an emerging market. But can't we get it a whole lot lower? And I don't see any reason why not. I think it's just going to be a process that's going to be carefully managed. I expect no reason why it won't be. National Treasury, Reserve Bank, they are reputable institutions, so that's all good and well. But let's get that conversation going so that when inflation is in the right place, we don't have to start the conversation. We can wrap up the conversation and then we can say, cool, we're done. Everything's rosy. Let's start to look at a lower inflation target. I think it's a great idea. I think let's start that conversation. Let's get it going. We'll park it there for this week. Remember, two events, 18th, 5.30, webcast and in person. If you're in Rosebank, come along. It's going to be lacquer. We've got a bunch of people coming already. When we used to, pre-pandemic, do the Power Hours Live, it became a social event as much as a learning event. Uh, and then, of course, 23rd at 11, justonelap.com slash events for more information. My name is Simon. We'll park it there. We'll be back again next week. As always, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.